Well, hello, I'm Josh, and I'm back once again with another great film to tell you about. And to kick off the new year, I've got a real classic for you. I'm talking about Carol Reed's 1947 film noir, Odd Man Out. Odd Man Out is set in 1940s Belfast and follows Johnny McQueen, a chief in an unnamed nationalist organization who has recently escaped from prison. He is weakened from his escape and considered a liability to his group, but wanting to prove he is still capable, he insists on going along with them to a robbery. The heist goes wrong and McQueen is shot while trying to escape. He then kills one of his pursuers, but later falls out of his car during the getaway. Now separated from his crew and wounded out in the streets, Johnny McQueen must try to survive the night while the whole city is out looking for him. Though unlike most movies where all the characters are out looking for the same thing, often referred to as a MacGuffin, in this film, the MacGuffin is our main character Johnny, and unlike the book the story was based on, the director Carol Reed removes all references to the IRA, which is known as the organization in this film, and chooses to focus less on the political terms and more on the humanity of the situation. Instead of choosing sides in the conflict, the characters each decide whether they want to help McQueen or pass him off to the next person, saying they can't get involved. Or in the case of the painter, tries to use his misfortune in a way that will help himself with his own art, though at Johnny's expense. And in doing so, it ends up making the film feel much more universal, so even those who aren't familiar with the conflict can relate to it. And as I said, this film was directed by the great British filmmaker Carol Reed, who was well known for creating some of the most acclaimed British noirs of the period. And though film noir is normally associated with American cinema, it of course draws a lot from German expressionism, and so naturally has a lot of history in Europe as well. And so you'd have British filmmakers like David Lean making these very noirish looking dramas with dark and moody lighting that emphasized realism while sometimes even utilizing real locations. Meanwhile on the other end you'd have filmmakers like Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger who would make these very bold and often dreamy films which took advantage of the studio space by putting the audience in the perspective of the characters and manipulating the world around them. But with Odd Man Out, Carol Reed really made a name for himself by combining both of these approaches into one film. He utilized the gritty black and white cinematography of Robert Krasker, who specialized in the medium, having previously worked with David Lean on Brief Encounter, and would later earn an Oscar along with Carol Reed for The Third Man. Not to mention doing some beautiful black and white cinematography in even later films like Joseph L. Mankiewicz's The Quiet American. But amongst all of this gritty realism with the on-location cinematography, Reed also incorporates some incredibly dreamlike visuals that show Johnny's mental state. Whether it be seeing people he knows in the bubbles of his drink, or watching the artist's paintings rise off the wall and float in the air, I just love how expressive this film becomes, and not just with the visual effects. Over the course of the film, the lighting changes from day to night, and the weather goes from raining to snowing, so you really get to see this world around Johnny change throughout the night. So often it seems filmmakers are afraid to step outside the box and be a little creative with how they show things, and so it's really cool to see how operatic this film becomes while still being contrasted with the gritty and naturalistic locations. And it's not just in the visuals, the film score also plays a huge role in carrying along these emotions. I mean, the composer William Alwyn even worked out a good bit of the score with Carol Reed before they shot the film. And so for many of the scenes where James Mason is walking through the streets and the music is swelling around him, they actually played the score off camera so Mason could almost sync up his movements with the music. And this is not in a cartoonish way, mind you, but it really allowed for Mason to get into the right headspace much easier than if he was doing it with only a guess of how it will feel on screen. And Italian director Sergio Leone was also famous for doing this on films like Once Upon a Time in the West, which also maintains a very operatic feel with its score. And so though it's not really a practical technique for scenes with any dialogue, 
the benefits of it are very plain to see on screen. And this is easily one of James Mason's greatest performances, and I believe it was his personal favorite as well. Though he was in no way a minor actor, he didn't always get to play the lead either. He was nearly just as often a supporting cast member or even the villain in films like North by Northwest. So here Mason's acting really gets the chance to shine, and from what I've gathered, he was still an up and coming actor in those days, and so this was the performance that really put him on the map for most people as a great actor. And Mason is not alone, this film is filled with fantastic performances. To name a few, you have Kathleen Ryan as Kathleen, who loves Johnny and has been taking care of him ever since his escape. Robert Beatty as Dennis, the gain second in command. Robert Newton as the crazed painter Lukey. F.J. McCormick as the poor scavenger who helps Johnny. And Dennis O'Day as the police inspector. And if you look close, you can even spot British actor and comedian Wilfred Bramble on the bus as this is his first film, though he goes uncredited. And if you're wondering who that even is, he's probably best known nowadays for playing Paul McCartney's mischievous grandfather in A Hard Day's Night. But as I said, those are just a few notable mentions of this great cast. Often in some of these older films, you find that there was a tendency to act very big to convey the character's intentions more clearly, and I know I've been throwing the word operatic around a couple times in this video, but I was really surprised with how minimal everyone's acting is in this film. They know the camera can pick it up and the music will do its job, so you don't really see anyone overdo it here. I mean, some characters are certainly more extreme than others, but I think you'll find the acting still holds up really well today, even for a modern audience. So if you like to watch Odd Man Out, it's a pretty easy one to track down. It's available to rent or buy from all the usual sites online, and it's currently streaming on the Criterion channel and Max. And you can watch it for free with ads on sites like Tubi, Plex, and even Shout Factory TV. So there's not really much excuse for missing out on this one. And you can also buy the film physically in several different formats and variations as well. I can definitely recommend the Criterion Collection version on DVD or Blu-ray. It's got a great cover of James Mason here and some really interesting bonus features as well. One in particular that I thought was really cool was on the music that I kind of touched on in this video, but there's a lot more of it on this disc if you want to check that out. And there's also a radio adaptation as well as a full documentary on James Mason as he returns to his hometown. And if you've been watching my videos for any amount of time, you've probably picked up that I'm a pretty big fan of these Criterion editions, but this one in particular is pretty special as it was the first Criterion film I ever owned. I remember I went to Barnes & Noble actually looking for The Third Man, which is now kind of famously out of print in its Criterion edition, and I guess it probably was then too because I could not find it anywhere, but I saw Odd Man Out, and I remember coming across that name while I was looking up Carol Reed, and so I thought I'd give it a shot, but when I put this disc in, I just remembered being blown away by the visuals, and also just all the supplements, and just the presentation, and so I think I can safely say that if Touch of Evil is what really got me into watching classic movies, Odd Man Out is what got me into collecting them. So now for my comment question, and I'm wondering, What's the film that really got you into watching classic movies? Most people nowadays don't really tend to give older movies that much thought, much less the black and white ones. And unless you grew up with them or just always happened to enjoy them, most people have one or two films that really got them to realize that older movies still have a lot to offer, even though they aren't quite as flashy or as fast-paced as movies today. So like I said, I'm just wondering what kind of movie got you excited about watching classic films and maybe even collecting them. Put your favorites in the comment section down below and start discussing. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this video and subscribe if you want to see some more of these. Remember to keep watching movies and I will see you again soon.